Hello, my name is Philippe Girard, a professor in the history department at McNeese State University. I'm Candy Thornton, also from the history department at McNeese. And I'm Leighton Langley. I'm also from the history department at McNeese. Welcome to your Grandma Rocks, where we explore the lives of famous women in history. Welcome and bienvenue à nos amis francophones. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. On the program today, music and history, as we retrace the life of a remarkable woman. She was the queen of, the queen of France in the mid-16th century. She played a key role in the French wars of religion. She was a member of one of the most powerful families in Europe. And she helped bring the Renaissance to medieval France. Her name was... Catherine de Medici. Before we get into the details of her life, let's start off with a song. It's a royal song, Somebody to Love by Queen. Bonjour and welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks. We just listened to Somebody to Love by Queen. I'm Candy Thornton. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. And I'm Leighton Langley. Today we're exploring the life of the Queen of France, Catherine de Medici, and some of the juicy conspiracies that she may or may not have been involved in. How about we kick things off with a little bit of background information? Sure thing. Catherine was born in April of 1519 in Florence, Italy. That would be during the Renaissance, right? Correct. And in fact, her father Lorenzo was a patron of, to many Renaissance artists. Florence was ground zero for the Italian Renaissance, and the Medici were one of the wealthiest and most powerful families in Europe during this time. So she really was smack in the middle of things. Yeah, and I'm sure that Lorenzo had no trouble purchasing a couple of brushes and a few gallons of paint. Right. Unfortunately, her parents' wealth could not save them from the disease that took their lives only a month after Catherine was born. She grew up an orphan. <laughs> All right, Dr. Giroux, we're trying to keep things light here. Believe me, we've done worse on the show. We've covered rape, genocide, cannibalism, incest. We've done some, some pretty horrible things. We even did British history once. I've seen it all, trust me. All right, moving on then. Grimace, her parents' demise may be, played a key role in her marriage to the future king of France. Really? How so? Well, Catherine was eventually placed into the care of Pope Clement VII. What does a pope have to do with her marriage to a future king of France? Well, many noblemen from across Europe were trying to have Catherine's hand in marriage. So when Francis I of France proposed that Catherine marry his son Henry, Pope Clement VII gladly accepted the offer. And so, with the pope's blessing, they were to be wed. How sweet. 
1533, at the young age of 14, Henry and Catherine married in France. I'm 21 years old, and the thought of getting married right now makes me nauseous. Don't overdo it. Marriage is not that painful. I don't want to be rude, but aren't you divorced? Oh, that hit the mark. Now, I'm the one feeling nauseous. Well, so back to the teenage bride then. Right. Catherine married in 1533, but she didn't become queen until 1547. Well, that when King Francis I, or François Ier, her father-in-law, uh, died? Yes, and actually her husband had an older brother, also named Francis, who was the rightful heir, but he died from getting a fever after a game of tennis. Who knew that a routine game of tennis could prevent you from ever inheriting the throne? Such a pity. There's actually a bit of conspiracy surrounding his death. As we will soon find out, Catherine is often found in the thick of things when it comes to conspiracy. What was the conspiracy around her brother-in-law's death? Well, he collapsed shortly after drinking a glass of water brought to him by one of his servants. After a healthy bit of torture, the servant confessed to poisoning the water that killed the prince. The servant also confessed to being on the payroll of Charles V, who was no friend to the French crown. I'm no detective, but it seems fairly suspicious if a prince collapses and dies immediately after drinking a glass of water. But then again, maybe people admit to things they didn't do under torture. Well, supposedly when the servants' quarters were searched, different books about poison were found. This sounds more like a nighttime crime drama than a history lesson. Like I said before, Catherine always seemed to be in the mix when it came to murder conspiracies. Now it's time for a song. How about one that speaks about the love between two people? Here's Jack and Diane by John Mellencamp. Jack and Diane, two American kids growing up in the heartland. Jack is gonna be a football star. Diane's debutante backseat of Jackie's car. Sucking on chili dog outside to taste free. Diane sitting on Jackie's lap, got his hands between her knees. Jackie say, hey, Diane, let's run off behind the shade of trees. Dribble off those Bobby Brooks, let me do what I please. Say, oh, yeah, life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone. Say, oh, yeah, life goes on long after the thrill of living is gone to walk on Jack is his back flexes thoughts for the moment scratches his head and does his best James Dean well, then, there, Diane, you gotta run off to the city. Diane says, baby, you ain't missing nothing. But Jack say, oh, yeah, life goes on. Long after the thrill of living is gone. Oh, yeah, they say life goes on. Long after the thrill of living is gone. Welcome back. I'm Leighton Langley, co-host of Your Grandma Rocks, your favorite women's history show on KBYS. And I'm Candy Thornton. Et je suis Philippe Girard. Vous écoutez la radio de l'Université McNeese. We just listened to Jack and Diane by John Mellencamp. Shame he didn't name the song Henry and Catherine, though that doesn't have quite the same ring. I'm also not sure if John Mellencamp is well-versed in the life of Catherine de' Medici either. But let's get back to the conspiracies. Sure thing. So the main job of a queen in this time period was to produce heirs for the throne. 16th century society has a reputation for not being very progressive when it came to women's rights. 
Or most centuries, for that matter. It gets worse than the idea of women being nothing more than wombs, trust me. Catherine's husband was not affectionate toward his wife at all. In fact, he cheated on her and had, the child, had a child with his mistress. This only piled on the pressure to produce an heir. Did Catherine have trouble getting pregnant? As a matter of fact, she did. The topic of divorce was even discussed because she was unable to get pregnant. Or in a Catholic country, annulment. Please tell me she did not suffer the same fate as the wives of Henry VIII in England? Fortunately, she did not. She was able to keep her head secured on her body. She did, however, try several different home remedies to get pregnant. In 1544, she gave birth to a son and named him after King Francis. Well, she must have been rather relieved, as well as her husband, because now he had the heir he was hoping for. This is an interesting story, but where exactly is the conspiracy? Catherine's not the key player in the conspiracy. She's more the subject of it. During this time period, women were often subject to suspicions of witchcraft. Right, and some of the suspicions included ridiculous things like being left-handed or your neighbor getting sick. Catherine was suspected to be a witch by some people because of her inability to have children, which all normal women did. Not having kids was unnatural and maybe proof of witchcraft. Assuming someone is a witch because she can't have children seems to be quite a leap. I agree, but as usual, context is key. Catherine's interest in astrology didn't help her case either. Sure, but once she had children, the suspicions must have gone away, right? If only. The public attitude resembled the type of story you see in a supermarket tabloid. The title would have been something like, Queen or Witch, Our Beloved Queen Cannot Bear Children. Is Dark Magic to Blame? The 16th and 17th centuries were really the high watermark for witchcraft accusations. Being barren was actually not the only reason a woman might be suspected of witchcraft. Often the victims were independent, outspoken women, whose main crime was that they wouldn't keep their head down. So, if you had no kids and you were an outspoken feminist, people yelled, burn that witch. Exactly. Since Catherine of Medici was a powerful woman and a foreigner to boot, people must have been quick to start the rumor. Yep, I think it's time for another song. What do you have in store for us? To keep with the witch theme, here's Black Magic Woman by Santana.
Bonjour à tous and welcome back to Your Grammar Rocks on Kibi Wes. This was Black Magic Woman by Santana. Je suis Philippe Girard. And I'm Leighton Langley. Today we're covering the life of Catherine de Medici, the 16th century Korean of France, and we are focused primarily on her tendency to be involved in conspiracy, or at least to be accused of being involved. Now it's time to move into another conspiracy that our beloved Catherine de Medici was involved in. This story is a bit more evidence-based than the gossip you may hear in your average 16th century beauty parlor. This is about Catherine's involvement in the French Wars of Religion, particularly the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. What exactly was her involvement? Well, we have to backtrack a bit to the days before the actual event and give a little background for those who aren't familiar with the French Wars of Religion. I can't believe there are people out there who aren't familiar with the history of France, but go ahead. Setup is always important. To keep it simple, the French Wars of Religion were essentially a struggle for power between the Catholics and the Huguenots, aka the Protestants. These wars of religion lasted roughly from 1562 to 1598. Including the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in 1572 when thousands of Protestants were stabbed to death all over France. Right, and in the days before the massacre, Catherine's daughter Margaret was set to marry Henry III of Navarre, who was a Huguenot. Which is to say, a Protestant. Right, Henry's mother accepted the offer of marriage on the condition that her son stay a Huguenot. Two people of conflicting religions are going to get married? Good to know that love can prevail over religious bigotry. Wait, it gets worse. When Henry's mother, Jean, got to Paris to purchase an outfit for the wedding, she fell ill and died right before the wedding was set to happen. Another sudden death. Though to be fair, life expectancy was low back then, and people often died young of unexpected causes. I remember visiting a castle in France where Catherine of Medici lived, and the tour guide explained that she lived a long life because the only thing she ever drank was wine. Like uh, all the time? Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. How was that supposed to help her health? Uh, water was filthy back then. People kept dying of waterborne diseases like typhus. Uh, we just saw how Catherine's brother-in-law died drinking water after playing tennis. So alcohol was not good for your liver, but it was still safer than typhoid. As long as no Italian queen poisoned your wine, that is. To be clear, there was little to no evidence to support the claim that Catherine poisoned Jean, but some Huguenot writers accused Catherine of killing Jean due to the bitter exchanges between the two women in the years prior. But these accusations remain just that, accusations. That doesn't seem like the jaw-dropping conspiracy you were getting me excited about. Wait, this is all still part of the setup to a bigger plot. <laughs> Catherine's daughter Margaret and Henry of Navarre married on the 18th of August, 1572 at Notre Dame. August 18th, so just days before the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, right? Right. And it's a royal wedding between a Protestant groom who won't convert to Catholicism and the Catholic daughter of a Catholic queen in a majority Catholic country? Right. All of that is at the height of the wars of the Protestant Reformation in Europe? Right. What could possibly go wrong? I'm sure you could have cut the tension with a rapier. But before we get to the blood and gore of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, I think it's time for another song. This was appropriately titled Killer Queen by Queen. She keeps a moe in a pretty cabinet with the meat cake, she says, just like Marie Antoinette. A building a remedy for Chris Job and Kennedy. And it's an invitation you can't take. Caviar and cigarettes, well versed in etiquette, extraordinarily nice. She's a killer queen, got body gelatine, dynamite with a laser beam. She never kept the same address In conversation She spoke just like a baroness Middle back from China With time to get your mind up Then again incidentally She's a that way I'm clean Love you came naturally From Paris naturally. Because she couldn't care less Fastidious and precise She's a killer Queen Got body gelatine Dynamite with a laser beam Guaranteed to blow your mind
of a hat. She's as really good. Playful as a pussycat. Momentarily out of action. Temporarily out of class. So absolutely try. This was Killer Queen by Queen. You're listening to your Grandma Rocks on KBYS. I'm Leighton Langley. Je suis Philippe Girard. And I'm Candy Thornton. Today we're retracing the life of Catherine de' Medici, a noble woman of Italian birth who became Queen of France during the Wars of Religion. Now back to the royal wedding of Catherine's daughter of, with Henry of Navarre, which took place in August 1572. Which didn't start on a right foot. The groom's mother was murdered shortly before the wedding. A few days after the wedding, a prominent Huguenot leader, Admiral Coligny, was walking back to his room when he was shot. An actual smoking gun was found in a window, but no suspect was ever found. I smell a rat. That's quite a sense of smell you have there, because in the days that followed this attack, a bloody fight between the Catholics and Huguenots broke out. Many people believe that Catherine was behind the attack on Admiral Coligny. So it was some time of political strategy to rile up people and start a riot then? It seems to be that way. Catherine certainly had the wit to pull off something like that. I mean, come on. She had many of the Huguenot leaders gathered in her city for a royal wedding. She also knew that the Huguenots would be greatly outnumbered. So it is believed that she arranged the attack in order to spark up a fight. How many people died in those massacres? Between five and 30,000 were butchered all over France with blades and such. Imagine the scene for a second. It must have been a bloodbath. And Catherine was in the midst of that all, possibly as the instigator. Boy, there never seems to be a dull moment in her life. No, but if it was part of the plan, it worked. A lot of Protestants converted in an effort to avoid being killed. One of those converts was Henry, Catherine's son-in-law, who became Catholic. It's a famous moment in French history. I remember learning that as a kid in France. Henry is supposed to have said, Paris is worth a mass, which is to say, I'll give up my God so that I can get the crown one day. How do you say that in French? Paris vaut bien une messe. People still use that expression when they want to justify political opportunism today. How sometimes it's best to give up your ideals if you gain something valuable in return, like the throne of France. That Henry seemed to be a crafty fellow. He was a smart man. He later became king and ended the wars of religion with the Edict of Nantes, which finally allowed Protestants to practice their faith. He's my favorite French king, actually. Gets to know that the story ends well. In the meantime, let's try and lighten up the mood with a little bit of an upbeat song. I like that idea. Here's Oh What a Night by Frankie Valley and the Four Seasons.
Bienvenue à tous, this was Oh What a Night by Frankie Valli and the Four Seasons. Je m'appelle Philippe Girard. And I'm Candy Thornton. And I'm Leighton Langley. You're listening to your Grandma Rocks on KBYS, a show about famous women from centuries past. Today we retrace the life of Catherine de' Medici. We followed her from her upbringing in Florence, Italy, to her role as Queen of France during the Wars of Religion, and how on multiple times she was accused of orchestrating poisonings and massacres behind the scenes. Which may sound crazy, but remember these were violent times. Poisoning a rival or killing someone who worshipped a different god was par for the course. Think of the Borgias. Right. Now let's move on to Catherine's later years and what she left behind, shall we? Sure. Though Catherine's life seems to be riddled with murder conspiracy and wild accusations, her life was not all doom and gloom. In fact, she had a lively passion for the arts. After all, she was from Florence, which is where the Renaissance started. We did mention at the beginning of the show that her father was a patron of the arts. She was also a patron of the arts, having introduced France to the Renaissance for approximately 30 years during her time as queen. She was also a prolific collector. She collected things like portraits, fabrics, pottery, and many other types of art. Seems like she inherited her father's passion. She did. Catherine also did work in theater, particularly musical shows. Through her involvement, she slowly changed some of the elements of traditional French theater. Catherine's influence is said to have led to the creation of the first official ballet. Well, that is certainly something worth remembering her for. I agree. I was being ironic. Because of her, millions of dead out there have been forced to attend ballet recitals while holding a stupid bouquet of flowers. Thanks, Catherine. I seem to be hitting a lot of raw nerves today. Sorry about that. Catherine's true love, however, was in architecture. She was directly involved in the planning of two beautiful palaces in Paris. She also had a grand tomb built for her husband as the centerpiece for a new chapel. Some of the buildings she planned are still around today, including one of the chateaux. I visited the Chateau of Chenonceau where she lived. It's an absolute beauty and very unusual. Most of it is actually built on a bridge that crosses the Cher River. I highly recommend visiting it. The Cher River? Don't know enough of French geography. Where is this? It's part of the Loire Valley in west central France. The region has a mild climate, so kings and queens of the Renaissance often built many castles in the region. Like to fight wars? Oh, no, no, by that time cannons had been invented, so medieval castles were completely obsolete. Uh, the Loire castles are pleasure palaces with big windows, gardens, reception halls. They're not meant to fight wars. Francis I, uh, the father-in-law of Catherine, he had a magnificent hunting hall called Chambord, which is also worth visiting. Then at the castle of Amboise, where Leonardo da Vinci spent his last years, all of them are in a 100-mile stretch of the Loire River. Definitely visit the area if you're into Renaissance art. I'll keep that in mind. As soon as I finish college, get a real job, make some money, and save enough for a trip to Europe. Don't worry, you're getting a degree in history. You're gonna make big bucks. But back to the lady of the hour. Not for long, I'm afraid. On December 23rd, 1588, Catherine de Medici took her final breath at the ripe old age of 69. What a shame. So I must point out again, 69 was a very old age for the time. And all that thanks to border wines. Yeah, just don't mix wine and politics though. Or wine and poison, or poison in anything. With all the conspiracies and plots Catherine may, or may not, have been involved in, I think it's safe to say that she certainly lived a full life that was nothing short of eventful. She also spared no expense when it came to her true passion, the arts. She was indeed a remarkable woman, unless you ask a Huguenot, perhaps. <laughs> That's true, though ultimately it's difficult to know how many of these stories about her are true, and how many are just spite because she was a powerful woman. Right, burn that witch, they used to say, or... Lock that bitch in modern English. We've encountered that before. We did shows about Anna and Jinga, the Queen of Angola, and Theodora, the Empress of Byzantium, and they too were the victims of some vicious slander. The difficulty is always to figure out what is true, and it was just pushback against the idea of a woman being in power. We'll have to leave it there. Too bad. Poison, red wine, massacres, French chateaus, and fine arts. That sure was a wild ride. What an interesting life. We're glad we could share it with you. Quelle vie incroyable, en effet.